I see some old face I can recognize. What shall we talk about? If one may, I like to point. One like to point out that we are a gathering of serious people who are concerned with their daily life. We're not concerned whatsoever with beliefs, ideologies, suppositions, theoretical conclusions, or theological concepts. Nor are we trying to find a sect a group of people who follow somebody. We are not, it's hope, frivolous, but rather that we are all together concerned with what is happening in the world, and our responsibility to it. All the tragedies, the utter misery, poverty. Not in this country, there are no slums. We were told the other day, you couldn't have slums in this marvellous climate. though it has been raining day after day. But let's hope during these meetings that we'll have fairly good weather. And we also would like to point out, if one may, that you and I, the speaker, are walking, taking a journey together. Not in an aeroplane high up of 31,000 feet or 40,000 feet, but walking along a quiet road, a long, endless road all over the world, where one sees appalling terrorism, killing for people for no purpose, just to threaten them, terrorize people, kidnapping people, hijacking, murdering, preparing to murder other people, wars, not only in Afghanistan, Beirut, in South America and all over the world. Perhaps most of you know all this. We don't seem to very much care, we're rather indifferent. It's only when it happens very close to us that we become concerned, worried, fearful. Where it is far away from us, each one of us, we're not so indifferent, or rather more indifferent. This is what is happening in the world. Economic division, religious division, political division, and all the religious sectarian divisions, and so on. 
there is a great deal of danger, hazardous. One doesn't know what's going to happen in the future, not only in our own lifetime, but also for your grandchildren, children, and so on. The whole world is in a great crisis. And the crisis not only out there, but also in each one of us. If we are at all aware of all this. And what is our responsibility to all that? on the part of each one of us. One must have asked this question of oneself very often. What is one to do? Where should one begin? Join a political party? Republican, conservative, democratic, communist, following Marx and Stalin and all that group. Where would you all begin? What would each one of us do facing this terrible society in which we live, each concerned with himself, with his own fulfilment, with his own sorrow, with his own mere misery, economic struggle and so on and on. Each one of us is concerned with himself, And what shall we do? Shall we pray to God? Repeat prayers over and over and over again? Or belonging to some sect, some guru, and follow him? escaping from the world. Put on some medieval dress or modern robes with peculiar colour and all the rest of it. Can we withdraw from the world at all? like monks, both in India and here. Seeing all this, observing intimately, not as something in the newspapers, or something you have read about, or told about, or being informed, through journalists, novels, television, and all the information industry. What is each one of the role of each one of us? The responsibility. As we said, this is not an entertainment. We're not trying to entertain. We're trying to tell what you should do, each one of us. We've had leaders galore, hundreds of them. 
political, religious, those who say we are illumined, we have attained whatever they have attained. We had thousands of leaders, political, economic, religious, sectarian, and they have been utterly helpless. They have their own theories, their own way, and there are thousands of people who are following them all over the world. Quantities of money, really enormous wealth, not only the wealth of the Roman Catholic Church, but also the wealth of the gurus. It all ends up in money. So, if one may ask, what shall we do to get home? What shall we do a single human being? Are we at all concerned? Or are we seeking some peculiar satisfaction, gratification for ourselves? Or we are committed to a certain symbol, religious or otherwise, and we cling to that hoping that symbol, that what lies behind that symbol helps us. This is a very serious question. It's becoming much more serious now. For there is the threat of war. The total uncertainty. May, I, may the speaker inform you of a conversation he had with a Mr. X. May I? A conversation between this Mr. X and the speaker for several days continuously. The Mr. X <coughs> has travelled all over the world more or less, he told the speaker. He's fairly well read. gone to various institutions. Sometimes he joined them, and with a rush he got out of them. He followed one guru or another, and gave them up. And for a few weeks he tried to become a monk, and that too gave up. And he looked at the various political parties, extreme left, extreme right, centre, and the spectrum of political activities. And at last he said, I've come to talk with you. I'd like to have a conversation with you, at the same level as I am. Not your pretentious or your real, real position. I don't know what you are, 
I've read something about you. May I go on with this conversation? May I repeat? Does it interest you? And he said, let's talk over things together. Like two friends, you and I. Like two friends who have lived together in this sense in the world, been through every kind of travail. And he said to the speaker, what is it all about? Why is man born like this? Why has he become, after many, many, many millennia, what he is now? Through that long period of evolution, long period of time, suffering, anxious, lonely, desperate, disease, death, and always the God somewhere above, among the Olympian mountains, or on the River Nile, or in the ancient city of Benares in India. Let's forget all about those gods, and let us talk together as two human beings living in this world, in this marvelous country, which is the earth, which is so beautiful, which is the mother of all things. Right? You're following all this? Mother was worshipped. Because the earth is the mother. The Greeks had the Athena with several breasts, I think four on each side, representing that she was the mother of the earth, mother as the earth. And so he gave this Mr. X gave something of his inward thoughts, his outward activity. And he said, Why what is all this about? Why are human beings who have educated themselves, sophisticated experts in technology and can argue the hind legs of a donkey. You understand all these expressions? Who can invent gods and goddesses and everything? Why have human beings all over the world why are they in perpetual conflict? Not only with the environment, not only with their governments whom they have elected or dominated by a Politburo, or dominated by some dogma invented by ancient priests. But in spite of all this, why is each human being everlasting from the moment he is born till he dies, 
Why does he live in this conflict? That was the first question he asked. This Mr. X. Why? What is the raison d'etre or the cause of this conflict? Not only outwardly, but also most deeply, inwardly, subjectively inside the skin, as it were. Why is he in conflict? They have talked endlessly about peace. All the religions have preached long before Christianity, centuries before Christianity, live at peace. Be peaceful, be quiet, be gentle, generous, affectionate, loving. In spite of their propaganda, in spite of human beings programmed from their childhood, encouraged to be <coughs> aggressive or to be gentle or to go face the world for themselves, alone, fighting. You know all that. Is there an answer to this question? A final, irrefutable answer? That is, can human beings in this world, living their daily life, going to the office, keeping a house, sex, children, and all that, and also this search, this longing for something much more than the mere material things of life. Can this question be ever solved? And apparently man has not solved it. Though he's lived on this earth for two or three million years, and for fuel bill for 40,000 years or 50,000 years as a human being. We have gathered tremendous experience. We have gathered a great deal of knowledge. Mr. X was telling the speaker. We have gathered immense information technologically, but inwardly we remain barbarians, trying to kill each other, trying to compete with each other, destroy each other. So he came all that way, he said, a long distance, bus, train, aeroplane. And he said, answer this question. Is there a cause for this conflict? And if there, there is a cause, then Let's discover what the cause is. Not that you are going to lead me or tell me, 
but together, you, Mr. X, and the speaker, together. Not that you will tell me and I will accept. Or I will go and think about it. And come to some kind of my own conclusion. But rather, he said, Mr. X, that together, as two human beings, not one is sitting on a platform and the other are sitting down below. Sorry. But together, as two human beings, who have gone through a great deal of life, the loneliness, the desperation, the anxiety, the uncertainty, wanting love and not finding it, or loving and not be satisfied with that, always pushing, 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 always wanting to achieve something whether it is heaven, or illumination, or enlightenment, or become a multimillionaire, which is more or less the same thing. All want to achieve something. They are never content. They never know what peace is. They never sit quietly under a tree looking at the mountains, the rivers, the blade of grass, and the beauty of the earth and sunlight and the glory of an early morning. So, Mr. X said to me, said to the speaker, let's talk. Let us question each other, never accepting what I, what he says or what you say. I won't accept a thing from you. Nor will you accept a thing from me. So we are on the same level. You may be very clever, you may have a reputation which is nonsense, you may go around the earth, only certain part of the earth, all that doesn't count, it has no value, with which the speaker agreed wholeheartedly. So let us explore this curse which man is, has borne from the beginning of time. Why man, which includes woman, please, Why man lives this way? Why man is in conflict in his own intimate relationship? Sexually, the family, the whole network of Conflict. Right? So it came the next day, Mr. X, and we continued. We sat on a veranda on a beautiful day, overlooking the valley, 
the great mountains around us, snow-capped, marvelous valleys, blue, and lovely azure skies, and the sun glittering on the leaves, dappled earth. Everything seemed so marvelously alive, pulsating, full of energy. There we were, he and the speaker, watching this great beauty, never being with the beauty, always watching it. never feeling the beauty of one's heart and mind, be utterly sensitive to all the glory of the earth. He said, we won't talk about beauty, that's your business, you tell me about it. He said, we will, a little later. First, let us take the journey or explore together into this question of conflict. We are asking, must human beings bear with it, get accustomed to it, hold it, never, never be able to put it completely aside, so that his brain then can function as it should, completely untethered, completely free, not programmed, not conditioned. So, now, the speaker is putting this question to you. And also, we discussed this, talked over, debated this point. What's the cause of it? We are taking a journey together, I'm not asking you to tell me or I to tell you. What is the cause of it? Everywhere there is struggle. You might say there is struggle in, the, in nature. One of big animals lives on the smaller animal, and so on. In a forest, the little tree is struggling against the gigantic trees for light. You might say, <coughs> everywhere on earth, in nature, there is conflict, some kind of struggle going on. So why shouldn't we also go on that way? Because we are part of nature. They are out there, there is conflict. What human beings call conflict there, it may not be. It may be the most natural way of nature acting. The hawk, the eagle kills the rabbit, bears kill salmon, the tiger kills something swiftly, or the cheetah. This goes on killing, killing, killing in nature. And one might say we are also part of this whole nature. So it is inevitable that we should be in constant struggle. If one 
accepts that as it is natural, inevitable, there is nothing more to be said about it. Because you say it's natural. We'll go on that way. Because we are part of the whole earth. But if one begins to question it, Mr. X was telling the speaker, if you begin to question it, then where are you? That means, are you willing together find out because we are supposed to be a little more active, intelligent than the trees, the tigers, the elephants, the, not the elephants, fortunately they don't kill too many things, but they destroy trees, and the cheetah and all the rest of it. We may have come from the ape, probably where I have. We must be stray monkeys. And if we do not accept that conflict is the way of life, then what is one to do? Where does one start to understand the whole movement of conflict? Where does one, how does one feel one's way into all this? Either <coughs> the speaker said to Mr. X, either you analyze very carefully all the factors of conflict, one after the other, through analysis, self analysis or being analysed by another, or accepting the professional advice of professors, philosophers and psychologists, if one begins to analyse, will that bring about the discovery of the cause? Either the discovery will be intellectual, Right? through analysis, or that analysis may bring you a certain intellectual conclusion, or you put all the analytical factors together and see the whole. You understand? Is that possible? Or is there a different approach to the question? You I wonder if, we are, if, the, if Mr. X understands what the speaker is saying. So he asked Mr. X, do we, are we are still on the same level? Same comprehension. That is, the speaker is telling Mr. X, analysis implies one who is analyzer, right? Therefore, there is an analyzer and the analyzed, the subject and the object, right? Is there such a difference in oneself as the subject and the object? Are we getting together? That's the first question uh, the speaker asking Mr. X. You are the Mr. X. The analyzer 
has been encouraged through education, through conditioning, through being programmed, that he, the analyzer, is different completely from that which he analyzes. Right? Under a microscope, when you look at something very attentively, that very attention gives greater light to that which is being observed. Right? I won't go into this. The speaker says, I'm going to question the whole attitude towards analysis. I'm not accepting, the speaker is saying, I'm not accepting what the professional said about analysis, including those people who come from Vienna, or the latest American psychologists. I'm not accepting any of those. The speaker tells Mr. X, but I question it. I question the not only the activity of analysis, but who is the analyzer? If you can understand the analyzer first, then what need there be for analysis? Am I, am I going too fast? May we go together in this? I analyze myself. I've been angry or greedy or sex or whatever it is. And in, ala in analyzing, that is breaking up and looking at it very carefully, step by step, who is the observer? Is not the observer, the speaker is telling Mr. X, don't accept what he says, but together question, doubt. Is not the analyzer all the accumulated past remembrances? His condition through experience, his knowledge, his way of looking at his life, his peculiar tendencies, his prejudices. His prejudices, his religious programmed, being programmed religiously, all this is the past. All this is the background of his life from childhood. He is the observer. He is the analyzer. Whether that background includes communal remembrance, racial remembrance, racial consciousness, and so on and so on. He is the observer. And then he, the observer breaks it up into the observed and the observer. Right? Are you... So that very division in analysis creates conflict. Right? Are we together? You are the Mr. X, I am the speaker. Are we taking the same journey together? That is, the moment there is a division between the analyzer and the analyzed, there must inevitably be conflict of some kind of subtle, fatuous, no meaning, but it's a conflict, overcome, conquer, suppress, transcend, all these are efforts in minor or major form. Right? 
So one discovers that where there is division between the Swiss and the Germans, and the French and the English, wherever there is a division, there must be conflict. I and you, we and they, Not that there is no division. The rich are very powerful. But if we created subjectively a division, I belong to this and you belong to that. I am a Catholic, you are a Protestant. I am a Jew and you are an Arab. Right? So wherever between two people, this is so whenever there is this division between man and woman, between God and earth, between what should be, what is. I wonder if you... I'm asking Mr. X if he's following all this. Not only verbally, intellectually, which is meaningless, but with his heart, with his being, with his vitality, energy and passion. that wherever there is a division, me and you. I'm a woman and you're a man. So, one begins to discover the root of conflict. Is it possible for a human being living in a modern world have going to a job, earning a livelihood, right? business there, family here. I'm aggressive there and mild with my wife, submitting and bearing all that. So the one's life becomes a contradiction. Can that contradiction end? Otherwise we live in conflict. Otherwise one becomes a hypocrite. If one likes to be a hypocrite, that's all right too. But when, if one wants to live very honestly, which is absolutely necessary, to live with great austere honesty, not to someone, to one's country, to one's ideal, to one's... but to say exactly what you mean. And what you mean, you say. Not what others, what others have said, and you repeat, that's not honesty. Or believe in something and do quite the opposite. Right? All talk about peace. Right? Every government, every religion, and every preacher, including the speaker, talks about peace. And to live peacefully demands tremendous honesty and intelligence. So, is it possible, living in the 20th century or now, to live inwardly first? psychologically first, subjectively, not to have in oneself any kind of division. 
please do inquire, search, ask with passion. Not passion doesn't include fanaticism. Passion doesn't demand martyrdom. Right? It's not something you are so attached, and that very attachment gives you passion. You understand? That's not passion. You are, it is tied to something which gives you this feeling of passion, energy. Like a donkey tried to oppose, it can wander round and round and round, but you still held there. So, could we, Mr. X and the speaker, not telling each other what they should do, discover for themselves in all honesty, without any sense of deception, without any sense of illusion, whether it is possible, possible, not saying it is possible, but it is possible to live in this world, wars, all the horrors that are going on, without conflict, without division. Don't go to sleep, please. It's too early in the morning. If you are asked, you are the Mr. X, if you are asked, what should your answer be inwardly? You are a Swiss, a Hindu, an Indian, a Muslim, or follow some clique, or some group, some guru's followers. One, wouldn't one have to abandon all that completely? You may have a Swiss passport, the speaker has an Indian passport, but he is not an Indian. They don't like that in India. <laughs> but we have told them several times not to belong to any cult, to any guru, to anything. So you're going to find this terribly difficult. Not at the end of it you stand alone, but you under that is the comprehension, the, inter the, the inward awareness, insight into all that thing which is really nonsensical. It may give one momentary satisfaction, belonging to something, belonging to a group. belonging to some sect. But that's all becoming rather weary, wretched and ugly. So can one not be attached to any of this? including what the speaker is saying, especially, so that one's own brain, and strangely your brain is not the brain of another, or is also the other, you understand? Your brain is like the brain of every other human being has an immense capacity, immense, incredible energy. 
Look what they have done in the technological world. All the scientists in America are now concerned with Star Wars. We won't go into all that. The energy, you understand? The brain has this extraordinary energy. If you concentrate on something, give your attention to something. They have given attention to kill other human beings. So the atom bomb came into being. So our, our brains are not ours. They have evolved through long period of time. And in that evolution we have gathered tremendous knowledge, experience. And in all of that move state there is very little what's called love. You know, I may love my wife or my children or my country. My country has been divided by thought, geographically. It is the world. My world, the world in which one lives, is the entire world. So. My brain, which has evolved through long period of time, that brain with its consciousness is not mine. Because my consciousness, Mr. X is saying, is, I've read something about what you have said, I'm not repeating what you have said, but this is what I also feel come see it actuality, that wherever I have been, in every corner of the earth, there are human beings who suffer, pain, anxiety, lon desperate loneliness. And so we are, our consciousness is shared by all other human beings. Do you realize this? Not up here, not intellectual, but actually. If one really feels that, then there will be no division. I don't know. Whether you, one Mr. X, I ask him, do you see this reality? Not a concept of it, not an idea of it, not the beautiful conclusion, but the actuality of it. The, act, the actuality is different from the idea of actuality. Right? You are sitting there, that's actual. But I can imagine that you are sitting there, which is totally different. So, our brain, which is the centre of our consciousness, with all the nervous responses, sensory responses, centre of all our knowledge, all experience, knowledge, memory, your memory may vary from another, but it's still memory. You may be highly educated, the other may have no education at all, doesn't even know how to read and write, but it's still 
part of that. Right? So, your consciousness is shared by every human being on this earth. Therefore, you are entire humanity. Uh, you understand? So? You are in actuality, not theoretically or theologically or in in the eyes of God. We are all one. Probably gods have no eyes. But in actuality, wherever we go, there is this strange, irrevocable fact that we all go through the same mode, same anxiety, hope, fear, loneliness brings such desperation. So we are mankind. And when one realizes that deeply, conflict with another ceases. Because you are like me. Wonderful. So that's what we talked about, Mr. X and Mr. K. And also we continued about other things. For he was there for several days. But we first establish a real relationship, which is so necessary when there is any kind of debate, any kind of communication, not only verbal, but un not words don't convey profoundly what one wants. One, one desires to convey. So, at the end of the second day or the first day, we said, where are we? You, Mr. Rex, and Mr. K, where are we in this? Have we brought about Not change, change implies time. I don't know, I will go into that another time. Have we merely gathered, you understand, as we gather, harvest? We sow, which is you have come here, which is part of sowing, and you have listened to K. And Mr. X, what have you gathered? Which means gathering means accumulation. Right? You have gathered so much information. Please follow this, we'll stop presently. Don't get sleepy or nervous. You've gathered so much from professionals, from psychologists, from psychiatrists, from oh, you say, gather, gather, gather. And Mr. X, K asks him, have you gathered also? If you have gathered, then it becomes any other uh, gathering. I know I've gathered I or rather learned how to climb the mountain. Now I'm an expert at climbing the mountain. <coughs> I'm not, but <coughs> so we're brain <coughs> is like a magnet gathering. So uh, chaos, Mr. K. Mr. X, what have you gathered? Or are you free from gathering? 
is the way, you understand, please, if you have the patience, listen to me. Do we ever stop gathering? Gathering bed sheets, pillowcases, that of course, water, gathering a degree in order to have a good job. For practical things in life, one has to gather. Right? But to see where gathering is not necessary, that's where the art of living comes. Because then if you are gathering, our brain is never free, is never empty to I won't in the go we won't go into the question of emptiness, but that's a different matter. But are we aware that we are gathering, gathering, gathering? As we gather habits. And when you have gathered so very difficult to get rid of it. This gathering conditions the brain. Born in India, belonging to a certain type of people, tradition, religious, oh, very, very, very orthodox, and you have gathered all that. And then to be free of all that takes immense inquiry, searching, looking, watching, aware, and what you say, what follows. So, is it possible not to gather at all? Please consider this, don't reject it. Find out. You have to gather knowledge to go to your house, how to drive a car, what kind of to speak a foreign language, you have to gather words, verbal irregularities and all the rest of it. But inwardly, is it necessary to gather at all? Enlightenment is not gathering. On the contrary, it is total freedom from all that. Which is, after all, love, isn't it? I don't love you because I've gathered you. Right? I have sexually been satisfied with you. Or you are companionable, or I am lonely and therefore I depend on you. Then it becomes a marketable thing. Then we exploit each other, use each other, sell each other, down the river. Surely that is not love, is it? It is the quality of a brain that doesn't gather anything at all. And then what it says will be what it has discovered, not what other people say. And in that there is tremendous passion. Not lust nor passion, but it has no fanaticism. I don't suddenly become a strict vegetarian, now won't touch salt. Or I'm a Muslim, fanatical Shiites. You understand? They've all passion of a certain type. 
but they have become fanatical, inclined to martyrdom, all the rest of that business. So, I'm asked, the speaker K is asking, Mr. X, find out if you can live without gathering. You can't be told about it. You can talk, the, inquire into it together. But the actuality of never gathering, which is never the accumulated memory operating, this very, very subtle requires a great deal of inquiry. May we stop now? It's an hour and a quarter. We've talked. You haven't talked, but K has talked. But we have had a communication with each other. But we have established the basis of a communication in which there is no superior and the inferior. One who knows and one who does not know. Can we get up? Après vous, je vous prie. After you. <laughs> <laughs>